there are a number of things we need to address if we want to turn Newton from a nice idea into a really practical algorithm. We're solving a nonlinear system of equations, and we know that the Jacobian matrix is very important. It's the matrix of all first partial derivatives. And this thing may be really difficult to derive and to code. There are a couple different responses. One is called automatic differentiation, where we try to use software to do the thing automatically. That's a whole field onto itself. A simpler approach is to use what are called finite differences. Now, if we look at the jth column of the Jacobian, which is the Jacobian times ej, ej is our usual notation for a column of the identity matrix. That jth column of the Jacobian is just all the different partial derivatives with respect to xj. If we go back to the definition of a partial derivative, then we look at x and change just the jth variable, subtract off the original f of x, divide by delta, and take the limit as delta goes to zero. So we perturb only in the jth variable to find that particular derivative. So if we ignore the limit part and just choose a small value for delta, this is called a finite difference. That should approximate the true partial derivative. For reasons we'll get into in the next chapter, you want to choose delta to be roughly on the order of the square root of machine epsilon. To get the jth column of the Jacobian, then, we have to evaluate f at this additional perturbed point. So to get all n columns, we have to get n evaluations of f. Here's an implementation of the finite difference formula for approximating a Jacobian. So the inputs here are f, that's the function you're taking the Jacobian of. It should take an n vector as input and return an n vector as output. x0 is the value that you're trying to take the derivative or the Jacobian at. And y0 is the value of the function f at the point x0. We do that here because the external caller usually has that available. So rather than doing it again inside this function, we'll just take it from outside. So here we set the step size of our finite difference, square root of machine precision. We do allow for later on the length of the output vector to be different from the length of the input vector. For now, though, we're assuming those are the same. So the Jacobian will be a matrix of size m by n. And then the i is the n by n identity matrix. So we're going to loop over the columns. We're going to fill in the Jacobian by column. And we do that with exactly the formula from the book. Perturb the jth variable. Subtract off f at the original point and divide by delta. So here's an example of the usage. So here I'm defining a function of x x has two components, so I refer to x1 and x2 within the function. And f has to return a vector with two components. And we always want things to be in the form of a column vector, so I'm using a semicolon to separate the two, col the two components of f. And then here's an example point and the value of f at that point. So a two vector comes in and a two vector comes out. And now I call the finite difference Jacobian routine. So it's 2 by 2. And it's close to the exact values, but not precisely there. For instance, if I take this first component, derivative with respect to x1 is 2 times x1. So this should be 2 thirds. But you see, we lose about half of the digits, which is typical. Now this number down here should be 1 sixth. But again, it falls away from that somewhere around halfway in. 
Here's our pure Newton iteration once again. We're looking for this step SK, which satisfies a linear system of equations. And we're going to simplify the notation a little bit. If we approximate the Jacobian by finite differences or anything else, instead of JK, we'll write AK. So how do we get our hands on AK? The step has to satisfy this equation. But we might also want to try to copy the secant method. And the n-dimensional equivalent of the secant condition would be this, which we write without doing a division, essentially. In one dimension, that was enough to uniquely determine this approximate derivative. Right? That was the slope of the secant line. But in n dimensions, this is not enough of a condition to make a unique definition. So what we add is an additional condition that the difference from one step to the next in this Jacobian approximation has rank 1. There's an argument to be made that rank 1 matrices are sort of the simplest kind, and that's one justification for doing this. So when you make that assumption and work out the formulas, then we get this as the way to go from AK to AK plus 1. And this is known as the Broyden update formula. Typically, what we would do then is try the Broyden update, use it to find the next Newton step. If it doesn't lead to a good enough step, which we'll define in a minute, then replace the Jacobian approximation with a finite difference approximation, which is slower. Now using the Broyden updates is very advantageous. It doesn't require us to do any extra work, really, any extra evaluations of f. And we don't have to write a code to do the Jacobian. We do pay a price, just like with the secant method. The convergence drops from quadratic to something which is still superlinear. As we saw already in one dimension, Newton doesn't converge from every starting point, and it's even worse in n dimensions. So what we're going to do is, if we propose a new step by whatever method, we're going to just test the norm of the residual. Did it get smaller if we take that step? If it doesn't, then we need some way to come up with a different step. There are various approaches to this. So let's define this function phi as the inner product of f with itself. So it's the norm of f squared. So phi is a scalar valued function. And if we take its gradient, work out what the formulas say, then we see that it's proportional to the Jacobian transpose times f. From vector calculus, you found that the negative gradient is the direction of most rapid decrease locally. And so that might be a good direction to go when nothing else is working. That's a technique known as steepest descent or gradient descent. It's very, very important in machine learning. And now we're going to find a nice way that gets us between the Newton step and the gradient descent step. It's called Levenberg's method. You usually see this in a more advanced form called levenberg marquart but pure Levenberg is easier and it's about 90% of what we need. So the method says we're going to define the Newton step, or our quasi-Newton step now, by this equation. So that takes some work to justify, but let's just look at what happens. If lambda becomes small, then the equation simplifies to the standard Newton iteration step. 
On the other hand, if lambda becomes very large, then the A transpose A part doesn't matter very much. And what we find is that SK is proportional to this negative A transpose F. But if we look back at our gradient, this is exactly parallel to our direction of gradient descent. So this lambda is like a knob we can turn to go between Newton, which converges fast locally, and gradient descent, which gets us better steps more reliably. So if Newton isn't going well, you increase lambda. If things are going very well, you decrease it so that you can get that fast convergence near the root. This is a very convenient way to combine that superlinear convergence with a more global convergence behavior overall. This is a function for implementing Levenberg's method. I want to walk you through some of it. It's one of the most logically complicated functions in the book. The inputs, we just have this function f from n variables to n variables. I should say from n dimensional variable to an n dimensional output. x1 is the starting point of the iteration, and tall is a selectable tolerance for stopping. So based on that Input tolerance, we'll set a one tolerance for the residual norm and a different tolerance for the norm of the step being taken. Right, So these are roughly backward error and forward error. And we'll cap the number of iterations in case it seems to be failing. Right, the setup here is that x is going to hold all the iterations. You wouldn't always do that, but it can be useful just to check things like convergence. And fk is going to be the current value of the function at the most recent point. So k is the index of the current point. And we set k equal to 1. Uh, this s is going to be the step. We make it infinite so that the loop passes through the first time. And then ak is going to hold the current value or the current approximation to the derivative. So we're going to use Jacobian, uh, we're going to use finite differences on the Jacobian here. You could code in an exact Jacobian if you had one. And uh, remember that it needs to know where you want the Jacobian at, and then the value of the f at that point. Okay, jack is new is going to be a flag that helps us keep track uh, as to whether we've just recomputed the Jacobian or not. And i is an identity matrix that we'll be using inside the algorithm. Okay, here lambda is the parameter in the Levenberg formula, right? So large lambda implies a uh, gradient descent method, and small lambda gets closer to the Newton method. So this is the same as before. It's our stopping criterion, um, taking the same three criteria as before. Okay, now the step that we're going to try is based on this different matrix and this right hand side here. So we solve that linear system and get S. So S would be thought of as a proposed step. Since we haven't said for sure we want to keep it, we're going to create a temporary variable for the new value of X we would get, and then F new is the value of F at that point. So now the question is, should we keep it? The criterion is, did the residual get smaller? If yes, then we will keep this step. So y is used to help us do the Broyden update. Now we record the current value of f, the proposed value of x, and we update fk to keep in sync with that. And now we have a new value of k because we have accepted this and made one iteration. Since we did accept the step, we would like to be greedy and be more Newton-like next time. So we will decrease lambda. And then this is just the Broyden update formula. And we note that since we just did a Broyden update, whatever was true about um, this flag before, we know that we did not just use finite differences to, re to recompute the Jacobian. So we set that to be false. On the other hand, this else means we reject the step. And since we are rejecting 
we didn't like the step that we got, so we're going to try to become more like steepest descent, so we increase lambda. And in addition, unless we did just recompute the Jacobian, we'll do that now. So we'll call the finite difference routine again. And then we are set up to try again, compute a new proposed step, and so on. Finally, at the very end, after it's quit, one of the reasons it might quit is that we reached the maximum number of iterations. So we're just going to check the final residual one more time. If it seems to be larger than we would have liked, then we're just going to issue a warning so that the caller doesn't just blindly accept the result. That's the logic of this function. One of the things that happens as the algorithms get more complex and usually more practical is you get all these parameters. There's this one that's an official parameter for the caller, but there are these sort of unofficial parameters too, like y divide by 10 and multiply by 4. Uh, often that's just based on long experience with doing these things. There may not be a perfect value for every problem. 